Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. It's good to see so many people today here in this hall. Members of the Board of Governors, Yang Gurbahagia Datuk Muhammad Zainal bin Sha'ari, Ms. Sharifa Sofia, External Advisor, Scholarship Committee, Yang Gurbahagia Datuk Sri Yusuf Cete, His and Her Excellencies, the Ambassadors and International Embassies Representatives, CEOs, Directors, Heads of Al Bukhari Group of Companies, Representatives from Al Bukhari Group of Companies, AIU International Partners, Distinguished Guests, Members of the University, Members of the Press, Ladies and Gentlemen. Good morning and welcome to second public lecture in the AIU Public Lecture Series. So, you want to save the world? The AIU Public Lecture Series, AIU PLS, is a collection of inspiring lectures carefully curated in line with AIU ethos, which forms part of the university's efforts to share knowledge through public talks. The university seeks to provide the community and the wider public the opportunity to listen to outstanding speakers, Distinguished scholars and leading thinkers speak on a diverse range of topics such as and as well as provide a platform for intellectual engagement and lifelong learning. We had our first PLS in 2020, but due to the COVID outbreak, it was put off for two years and today, in conjunction with AIU's second convocation, PLS is back and we look forward for the next lectures in the series. And also, I guess you have noticed the booths um, at the foyer area. Those stalls are the evidence of social business empowerment. Feel free to visit after this talk. Let us kickstart our event today by lending our ears to welcoming remark to be addressed by Yang Barbahagia Professor Dr. Abdi Umar Shurie acting Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research and Innovation and also the Chairman of PLS of AIU. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh and a good morning to everyone. Uh, Ms. Sharifa, Sophia, Dato Zainal, our honorable uh, speaker, Professor Sibai Kemis, and her respected husband, who is also here with us, our top management of AIU, our lecturers, uh, students, uh, the dignitaries, ambassadors, our guests from outside, uh, our students who came late because they watch uh, football because the World Cup is going on. <laughs> and uh, I was wondering if also the girls were watching the game last night. <laughs> um, it is an honor uh, for me to chair this particular public lecture. It is actually the brainchild of Ms. Sharifa facilitated, conducted by Nato Zainal himself and his office, and co-hosted by AIU. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, public lectures are the most facilities that generate general and suitable knowledge for consumption. The classroom is very specific. The classroom is very dedicated. But I will urge you to always to go to public lectures uh, like this. Ladies and gentlemen, you know professors speak too long. And uh, I do not want, I prepared a, a speech, a long speech. But I do not want to read that intentionally, absolutely. But I would like to... Uh, thank uh, uh, Ms. Sharifa and Dr. Zainal, and I would like to thank the 
committee, the AIU uh, committee, who have, with the convocation and uh, with other commitments we had, who had actually tirelessly uh, organized this particular uh, lecture. Uh, and we will continue uh, in this garden of knowledge, uh, uh, garden of social business, uh, garden of inspiring those who would have no chances at all in education, educating those people. We will continue as AIU to provide all facilities uh, that humanities need. Our lecture today is on sustainability and governance, and this is very much in line with our niche area of this university. Uh, and that is what we will uh, continue to endeavor, uh, inshallah, in the near future. Ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome our distinguished uh, speaker, Mrs. Sisebe Kimis. Thank you so much. Um, it's an in, indeed, it's a huge privilege to be here um, and to think that Professor Muhammad Yunus was here as well. And he actually was the inspiration um, for me to start Earth Air. Um, so I'll share a little bit about that later. Um, so before I started, I wanted to show a video um, of one of our earliest artisans that we worked with. Uh, she unfortunately passed away to, uh, due to lung cancer earlier this year, but um, her name is Katnelli, and she is the very first Malaysian artisan that I worked with. So I just wanted to share a little bit about her story. Sorry, this is not the video. <laughs> Do we have the video? Well, I guess before we um, look for the correct video, it, it will be very good if I could introduce a speaker to you, right? Because as the Malay saying goes, tak kenal, tak cinta. So to cinta, we have to know the speaker first. So that will be very engaged and indulged with this talk today. Yes or no? Yes, all right. So, you want to save the world. That's the topic for today's public lecture. And I bet everyone here in this hall would want to save the world. That's why you're here today. Correct? Our speaker, Sassi Bai Kimis, left a successful career in the finance industry to start the award-winning impact enterprise and craftsmanship focused brand Earth Air in February 2013. Earth Air's story began with a desire to create thoughtfully designed contemporary heritage pieces which empower artisans from marginalized communities, refugees, and the differently abled. As part of its social and ecological mission, Earth Air focuses on the sustainability of its product and supply chain. Earth Air won the British Council and Arthur Guinness Project Social Enterprise Award 2015, and SASI was one of Wharton's 40 Under 40 Award winners in 2015, and an Eisenhower Fellow in the 2015 Women's Leadership Program. She was recently chosen as an Asia Young Leader 2017 by the Asia Society and is the country coordinator for Fashion Revolution Malaysia. <laughs> Prior to Earth Air, Sasi was a vice president in the investments division at Khazana National Malaysia a director in the private equity team at First Avenue Partners, LLP, London, worked in Ghana 
with Opportunities Industrialization Centers International, the United Nations Development Program in Accra, and in New York as an investment banking analyst at Lehman Brothers. Sasi received a Bachelor of Science in Economics, Finance and Management cum laude from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, and an MPhil in Environment and Development from Cambridge University. She has spoken widely at universities, conferences such as TEDx, and forums in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, United States, and Japan. I bet she is the perfect definition of social entrepreneur. And today, ladies and gentlemen, Sasi is here with us in AIU, ready to talk to us. So, you want to save the world? Nama saya Nelly, Julan Apoy. Saya seorang tenya. Dari kecil, saya memang minat menganyam. Saya belajar sendiri, berusaha sendiri macam mana ini boleh jadi. Semua anyam-anyaman saya mau coba. Apa yang mak buat, saya tengok. Dia tidak pernah juga ajar. Sekali dia tengok apa yang sudah siapkan, dia mengkritik. Baru sekarang saya tahu yang mak ajar dulu kan, yang mana salah, yang mana betul. Oh, patut lemak, arwah mak cakap macam itu dulu. Ini asas asas anyam tu ada mengkuang, rotan, memban, dan semua itu ada di kampung. Kami pakai barang ni hari-hari kan, pakai bawa padi di kebun mau ambil sayur apa kan, memang anyam juga dah. Mula-mula kami orang datang dari kampung kan di Batu Nia sana. Saya punya suami kerja, anak masih terdika. Sementara tunggu di terdika, saya buat anyaman di kaki lima tu. Sekali ada orang limpas, dia orang tempa. Saya target tu siap. Ali saya terima sikit duit untuk anak saya. Jadi saya yang belanja semua, semua keluarga. Saya tu memang dia banyak tolong dia, kerana dia yang pertama ambil order dengan saya banyak macam tu. Ya, bayar deposit dulu. Pakai duit ini, saya boleh beli lagi bahan dan saya buat untuk orang lain. Dia faham keadaan orang miskin, especially di Sasi. Saya anggap dia macam tempat saya mengadu. Tempat saya, saya apa masalah. Sasi kata yang orang lebih suka lagi kerja ada kualiti. Daripada awak buat banyak-banyak, tapi tidak ada kualiti, tidak orang mau beli. Saya dengar apa yang dia ajar saya kan, saya pun apply itu orang lain. Orang kampung harus pandai anyam. Tapi orang muda macam tidak minat lagi. Kalau semua orang tua ni meninggal, siapa yang buat benda itu lagi? Mudah-mudahan saya sehat dan saya akan buat desain yang orang mau sekarang. Mesti saya mau buat yang terbaik untuk mereka. Um, so before I actually start um, sharing about Earth Air, I wanted to tell you more about my own personal journey. Um, can I have the slides, please? <laughs> okay, great. Just going to test whether this works. Yes. All right, okay. Um, so I wanted to share a bit of my own personal journey to help everybody understand why I'm here today. Um, so I'm Malaysian. I was born in Ipoh, in Perak. Um, my family, my grandfather came from India in the early 1900s. Um, so my grandfather came here and then my dad was born here. So I'm second generation Malaysian. So when we were young, we used to travel to India uh, to visit uh, my mom's family. 
and my father's family. And the reason I put that up there is because that was a very pivotal moment in my life. Um, because that was when uh, we walked through some villages in India and we went to one village and everybody in the village came around and stood around us. And I was eight years old and my father stopped and people were asking for money. So he put his hand in and he took money out and he gave it to the people around us. And I remember thinking, coming from Malaysia, you know, we came from a, from a middle class family. You don't actually realize how much we have in this country. The fact that we have a roof over our heads, we have running water, we have sanitation. But so many places around the world, those basic needs are not available. And so at that time, that was the first time I realized my life is not the life that many other people have around the world. And as an eight-year-old child to realize that, then I, I realized about income differences and wealth differences. So I then went to school in Singapore uh, because my father wanted us to study in English. So I was in Singapore um, and then I graduated and at that point I didn't really know what I wanted to study. So I went to the US and I went to Penn, University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I was actually in the College of Arts and Sciences. I didn't even know what Wharton School was. And then when I got there, my dad found out about what Wharton is and it's a school for finance. He's like, oh, you must go and study there so that you can go there and, you know, learn finance and make money. So that's what I did. So my path at that time was studying finance. When I graduated, I went to New York and I worked at an investment bank, Lehman Brothers, because that's what everybody else did. And I thought at that time to help people, to help and make a difference in this world, what I needed was money. So I thought I'm gonna go and work at an investment bank, make millions, and donate those millions to the people that need them. Because that's what people need, right? People need money. Poor people need money. There's poverty, so if you have money, you can help. So I went to Lehman, and very quickly, it became very clear to me that um, everybody around me was concerned about the NASDAQ going up and down, and the New York Stock Exchange, while me, I'm sitting there at my desk in New York and I'm thinking about my time in India, I'm thinking about my time in Malaysia, and thinking about the people and the places that I come from and how those people need help. So I actually quit my job and I decided to go and do my masters uh, in Cambridge and I did a masters in environment and development. And it was during my masters that I wrote a thesis um, on microcredit because at that time social entrepreneurship was very very nascent most people didn't even know what it was and Pro Professor Muhammad Yunus was the first person who had proved that you can make money and do good at the same time so after my time in Cambridge I came back to Malaysia um, and then I got an opportunity to do an internship at the UN uh, in Ghana. So I went back to Ghana. I was 24 years old. I had no money, um, so I borrowed money from my, my mom, my parents. So my friends made fun of me because they were like, you're borrowing money to go and volunteer in Africa. They're like, why don't you just volunteer for me? I'll pay you to sweep my house. <laughs> so I went to Africa and back then, um, and still till today, people in Ghana, uh, Ghana is actually in West Africa, so what I'm wearing right now is from Ghana. It's a West African outfit. <laughs> um, so people in Ghana actually compare themselves to us here in Malaysia because Ghana achieved independence in 1957, which is the same time that we did. And 
they always talk about how Malaysia took palm oil um, from Ghana and what Malaysia has made out of palm oil here, while in Ghana it's still in a very nascent stage. So in my time in Ghana, I was working with UNDP and I was working with OIC. And at that time, we were working with um, HIV AIDS orphans. So we had programs that were feeding these orphans whose parents had died because of HIV. And one day, my boss came to me and she said, Sasi, I think we have to stop our program. And I said, why? She said, because Ghana is becoming more developed and the international aid coming to the country has dropped. So then I, you know, I was, that was when it hit me. When I was working in New York, we had a lot of money, but we didn't really have much interest in thinking about the well-being of others. Here I am in Ghana, we're working for the poor, we're trying to help people that need it, but we don't have enough money. Why is this? Why is it that where there's money, there isn't enough good being done, and where there isn't enough, where you're doing a lot of good, you never have enough money. And that's when I started thinking about this idea of social enterprise. Why can't we build businesses that do good so that they always have enough money and we can keep sustaining ourselves to keep doing the good that we do? And after Ghana, I actually went back to finance because I couldn't find a job in development. Um, oh wait, sorry. Um, I couldn't find a job in development. So I actually went back to London um, and I worked with a private equity uh, fund, working with hedge funds and PE funds. And so I got to the age of about 29. Can I have the slides back actually? Um, I got to the age of 29 and I was in London. Um, and you know when you, whenever you get to a birthday where that ends with a zero, I'm sure a lot of people here may feel this as well, you start thinking about what you've done with your life. You know, you become 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. That's when you think you have this sort of like existential crisis and you start thinking about what have I really done with my life? So I was 29 and I was in London and I was thinking about my parents, my family, I was thinking about Malaysia. And I was thinking, you know, what am I doing here, out here in London? Um, I should actually be going back to Malaysia and be a force for change because I was also tired of hearing and listening to the news outside of Malaysia, which was always negative. It was about how corrupted our country is or how our country is failing. You know, so I thought, instead of complaining about my country, I should go back to my country and try to be a force for change. So this is a photo of my father, and the reason why I have this is because when I left my job at Kazana, um, so I came back to Malaysia and I joined Kazana National. And um, I worked with Kazana for two to three years. And I let, when I left Kazana, my father, as any other Asian parent would say, why are you leaving your job? You have a secure income, you know, and I paid for your education. Why are you doing this? Um, and the reason why I did it was one day when I was going home from Kazana, I was driving home. And this was after I had worked for six months straight. I had been working for 12 hours, 14 hour days. And I fell asleep while I was driving. Um, so I woke up, it was a micro sleep. I woke up, I straightened my car. And that was when I decided that there's something I need to do with my life. And what is that something? I started to think through if I had died that night, what difference would my life have made? Would I have lived a life that I was proud of? Would I feel like the life that I've led has made a difference in other people? Or have I just built a life that amasses wealth for myself and not for others? So these are the questions that I started asking myself. So when I speak at universities, a lot of young people ask me, 
what do I do after I graduate? I don't know what to do and where to go. And these are the questions that I started asking myself. You know, why am I here? What are my passions? Where, where do I want to spend my talents and my time on? And I met a friend who actually told me that I should write a personal mission statement. And that's what I did. So why is it important to write a personal mission statement? So when I left Kazana, I took time to go to Hawaii. I learned natural farming. Um, and I was in Cambodia. And it was actually during my time in Cambodia that I met with a lot of artisans and weavers who had struggled with making income. So I started buying products from these communities that I met. And I came back to Malaysia and I started selling them. But I still didn't start Earth Air. I was trying to think through, what, what do I spend my time on? So I, I spoke to a lot of different entrepreneurs. And a friend of mine, Brian Wong, he actually said, Sasi, you need to write a personal mission statement. And I was like, personal mission statement? Who does that? You write a mission or vision statement for your company, not for yourself. But he said, take, t take time and write a sentence down that encapsulates what drives you. Because at that point in time, ladies and gentlemen, I was thinking of business ideas such as an alcohol delivery business. Because I thought, hey, people are having parties. Maybe they need alcohol and we will provide alcohol on the go. But then when I thought about it, will I want to wake up every morning and do this, even if it makes money? Is this something that I want to do when I wake up every morning? No. So I wrote down a lot of business ideas, and in the end, it came up that I actually decided to start Earth Air. And the idea for Earth Air, the name. So the name actually comes from this idea of Waris Bumi. And for those of us who know Malay, Waris Bumi is a direct translation of the word Earth Air. <clears throat> and the idea is that all of us here on Earth, we have a responsibility to care for the people and nature and whatever we have on this planet. So, this is my mission statement. So I wrote this now almost 11 years ago. And this is what I used to evaluate my business ideas. Any business idea I had, I looked at whether it matched my personal mission statement. If it didn't match my personal mission statement, I let it go. So I highly encourage all of you to think and to spend time developing your personal mission statement because that is what will help you decide what you should do next in your life. This is our vision at Earth Air. So the, the idea is that we want, through our work, to be able to encourage other people to realize that they are also waris bumi. That all of us here can influence what happens on this planet and have a responsibility towards caring for what is here. <clears throat> So, what do you do when you start a company? What does the university tell you? Before you start a company, you should write a business plan. I went to a business school where I wrote lots and lots of business plans. But when I actually started a business, I wrote zero business plan. I didn't have a plan. <laughs> what I did was, when I went to Cambodia and I saw the communities in need, I just started helping and I just started doing. So I saw a need, I started doing to help that need, and then I created the business along with it. 
So after I actually registered Earth Air, that's when I realized that a lot of the communities that I met with in Cambodia, Indonesia, India, Thailand, Vietnam, everywhere, a lot of the communities struggled with making designs that hadn't changed for more than 20 to 30 years, especially in Malay, in Malaysia. So when we first started Earth Air, I didn't even work with artisans in Malaysia because I thought Malaysia didn't have any artisans left. And, you know, I grew up in KL. I was an urban city girl. I, I was so ignorant of the rich heritage that we have in Malaysia. And in 2015, when we had the British Council Social Enterprise Award, that was when um, British Council said, hey, Earth Air, go and create Malaysian products. Because before then, we didn't have any Malaysian products. And we did that. So that was when I met Katnelli that you saw the video of just now. I met her in 2015. <clears throat> but you know what? Starting a business and running a business is very different than dreaming about a business. So being an entrepreneur was a huge wake-up call for me because I had left my comfortable job at Kazana where I got a monthly salary and I was at pop-ups and bazaars setting up a table selling scarves. So I actually remember that was, that was I know. one day I had a table at Bangsa shopping center uh, Bangsa Village, and I saw Ghanan walk past. Ghanan was our head of investments. And when I saw him, I left the table and I ran to the toilet. You know why? Because I was too embarrassed. I was too embarrassed to see him because I thought what I was doing was not important and it didn't have any value. In the sense that I felt like my social status in life had dropped because before I was a investment banking type person, but now I'm just a lowly social entrepreneur standing at a bazaar with a table and selling a bunch of silk scarves. And I started to, I really doubted myself um, about what I was doing and whether what I was doing was going to earn money and whether I was going to make money and whether the business would even be successful. Um, and then, of course, I had my father who asked me very tough questions like, how much money did you make your first year at Earth Air? And I told him, and he said, huh, that is only one third of what you would have earned at Kazana. So why didn't you just work at Kazana and donate one third your salary? You would do more for society than actually working in Earth Air. So why bother? So at that time, <clears throat> I actually thought of giving up. I had been running the business for three years with no salary, no staff. I was alone. I was the CEO, the toilet cleaner, the floor cleaner, the marketing person, the salesperson. I was doing everything. And I was burnt out. So August 2015, I actually told my family and I said, hey guys, I think I'm done. I'm going to shut this down. I've given this three years of my life. I can't go on anymore. I used to go to the toilet and cry because I couldn't pay my credit card debts like for things that I bought. So this is the stage that I was in. And <clears throat> that was the time that um, I got the Eisenhower Fellowship and that allowed me an opportunity to go to the US for seven weeks. So when I was in the US, um, it helped me learn new things. And one of the things that I learned was that, sorry, is that a slide before this? Oh, okay. 
Um, sorry, one of the things that I learned was um, how to scale Earth Air. So Surya specifically asked me to talk about this, okay? So when I had worked with people like um, Kat Nelly, she had only been selling to her customers in her small shop. So she had a little shop and she was selling to her customers there. So when I met her, um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so when I met her, she was making about maybe 10, 20 bags a month. And that year, when I went to see her, we had the Wharton Global Forum in KL. And I went to her and I said, Kat Nelly, we need to make 600 bags for a conference coming up in March. And she said, Sasi, there's no way I can do that. I'm alone. I can only weave about maybe 20, 30 bags by myself each month. Then I, you know, I helped her, I sat down with her, and I sat and I worked through with her how many bags she needs to make each month to be able to fulfill the order. And obviously we came up with the conclusion that she can't do it on her own. And so we had to recruit her whole village and I had to work through the pricing with her because she wasn't even sure that she would be able to make the bags at the right price and be able to sell it and for us to be able to sell it to Wharton. But we worked hard on it and we made the 600 bags and we delivered it in February. And Kat Nelly told me that from that order, she made eight months of income. And to me, that was my light bulb moment because I realized then that if I can help these artisans and the communities that we work with get big orders, we can change their lives. So instead of just focusing Earth Air as a B2C brand, we started doing B2B orders. So what I, meant by, what I mean by that is we started working a lot with companies, we started working with universities, we were doing corporate gifts, we were doing wedding gifts, we were doing um, event gifts. And this is when I saw that these gifts have a huge opportunity to change the lives of people. So we met with a lot of companies and a lot of companies have a budget for CSR, but their budget is, um, not to say that some companies don't do enough, but I, I do think they don't do enough because when it's a CSR budget, they want to buy things that are very affordable, i.e. cheap. So they normally want products from China. And so we had to do a lot of convincing and talking to um, universities and co companies to actually buy ethical gifts and buy ethical products that they could give away rather than buying products from China. Like, why not buy something made by a community in Malaysia that fulfills the purpose that you need it for, but also is changing the lives of a marginalized person? So we pursued these SDG goals in the work that we do. You know, focusing on sustainability, focusing on poverty reduction, and focusing on providing income and work. So Earth Air right now is the first fair trade certified and B Corp certified brand in Malaysia. The, to get fair trade certification, we had to be audited for more than two years. And to get B Corp certification, we had to be audited for almost a year and a half, two years. So a total of four years to get these certifications. And what these certifications mean is that we are a business that's focused on sustainability, on honoring the people that we work with, and being as ethical and as transparent as we can in our business. So the reason why we pursued these certifications is the first question that everybody asks me when I first sold Earth Air products, if you're helping artisans, how can you be making money? Why are you not an NGO? 
why are you a social enterprise? I mean, they didn't understand what social enterprise meant. And people were very suspicious of this idea that if you are making money, you can't really be helping people. So having these certifications has been immensely helpful for us because it helps us explain to people that we are certified, we are not exploiting the communities that we work with, we pay them fair wages and fair prices for the products that we buy. And our model is such that we work with the communities, we design the products with them, we buy the products from the communities, we pay them upfront, so that the risk of selling and the risk of the product is never on the communities that we work with. So as we started growing Earth Air, one of the things that started happening was I started, we started seeing a lot of other brands and other social enterprises come into this space and who were making very similar products to us. So one of the things that we started doing was we started making our products hybrid. What I mean by hybrid is we started making the bag body from one community, the bag handle from another community, and we started putting it all together so that our products are more difficult to copy. So we had to innovate um, and create new products that were harder to imitate so that we could create a competitive edge and have designs that were more unique in the market. Um, I wanted to share this because the bags that you saw Cartnelli make, uh, they are actually plastic strip bags. And we were buying those bags from her. And all of our products are usually natural, biodegradable, recyclable. But these plastic bags made out of plastic strips always used to stress me out because I used to think after the clients buy the bags and after a few years of using them, what if the bag breaks down? What happens to it? And our client doesn't have anywhere to recycle it. They throw it away. And it was the only product range in our, all of our products that was made out of plastic. But we went ahead and worked with it because we wanted to help the communities that we were working with. Because a lot of the communities in Sabah, uh, sorry, in Sarawak, a lot of the women in the interiors were using these plastic strips to make bags because they could no longer access rattan and natural fibers. So we were faced with a dilemma. If we are sustainable, we don't use the plastic strips. But if we want to help the people that we're working with, we have to buy this from them because this is the only raw material they have. So we went ahead and worked with these bags and we then found another social enterprise which recycles plastic. And now I am married to the founder of that social enterprise. My husband, Carlos, is sitting at the back. <laughs> so Sea Monkey Project actually recycles the plastic for us and they build plastic recycling machines to recycle plastic waste. So it's waste from uh, all kinds of plastic, like our bags, plastic bottles. Um, so they work with hotels, uh, companies, universities, uh, schools to help them recycle their plastic waste. So to me, being able to recycle the plastic bags was sort of like the end of, well, the circular, completion because that meant every single product that we have in our product range is something that we can say is recyclable, is biodegradable, and it's not going to harm the environment. And we are honoring our principles of being Waris Bumi. So these are some of the products that we've made. Um, this is Meng Kuang. Later on, you'll be able to watch a video um, of one of the artisans that we work with um, who weaves Meng Kuang pieces. And this is a collection of jewelry. Um, I'm wearing one of the earrings. 
Um, so we do a lot of work with refugees. So one of the reasons that we started to do this was because um, I met with a lot of different companies and a lot of different uh, Malaysians who are not very comfortable with us working with refugees. Um, because they said, why aren't you helping Malaysians? Why are you helping refugees? Um, and I don't know how many of us know this, but Malaysia has not signed the 1951 Refugee Convention. Um, so refugees in Malaysia have no rights. They cannot work. They are legally not allowed to be here. Uh, they are here under the protection of the UN Refugee Agency. Um, but technically, they're not allowed to work. But they live in this country. They need to feed their families. So we started a project with the UN Refugee Agency making jewelry by refugees. So the refugees that we work with are from Afghanistan, Palestine, Syria, Pakistan, um, and Myanmar. Um, so we work with Rohingya refugees, Chin refugees from Myanmar. And they make the jewelry. I'm wearing the earrings. <laughs> and this project was very meaningful to us um, because during the pandemic, there was a lot of xenophobia. There were a lot of Malaysians who were saying, foreigners, get out. So it, they, they were very unhappy about immigrants and there was a lot of negative social media commentary saying that foreigners were bringing COVID into Malaysia and infecting Malaysians. Um, so we wanted to show that refugees are as hungry as Malaysians in terms of wanting to work hard. And in fact, most of our refugee artisans, and I think our, my, the Earth Ed team will attest to this, our refugee artisans work harder than our Malaysian artisans because they want to survive, they want to grow, and they want an opportunity for dignified income. So during COVID, we actually um, made more than 20,000 pieces of PPE for Malaysian doctors and to save Malaysian lives. And I asked Malaysia Kini to cover this story because I wanted Malaysians to know that Refugees are not here to sponge off of us, but they are actually here to earn a dignified income, and they are making PPE that is saving Malaysian lives. So, so this is some of the things that we do. Um, we do a lot of entrepreneurship training. So we realize that in, as part of scaling our business, or scaling what we do, is not by growing Earth Air, but it's by growing the communities that we work with. So we started doing work training a lot of artisan communities. We worked with Mara, we worked with DDEC, we worked with WWF, um, and we trained artisan communities on financial skills and business skills. Because when is a social enterprise, when has a social enterprise done its job? It's when we cease to exist. So I hope that one day, the communities that we work with have the skills that they need to be able to reach markets on their own without having to depend on us. Because the whole reason that, a lot of the reason that we are here is because we work with communities that are not able to reach markets and they don't have market access, and they don't know how to access the market. And that is the key that is missing. So if you look at a lot of rural businesses, um, small businesses, and you see at a lot of training programs that go on. So I've looked at, you know, around the world, um, World Bank, and a lot of different global agencies, they do a lot of training. So they train people on how to make soap or how to grow your own vegetables. But they don't train people on how to sell. And that link to the market is what is missing. So that is what we do at Earth Air. We are helping communities and artisans link to market 
to be able to sell. Because there's no point in us just training people to make products and then you imagine in a village a woman has made a whole bunch of soaps and she's sitting there and she doesn't know where to sell them. How does she sell them? How does she find the market? So we started training entrepreneurs on how to market, how to sell, basically how to do what we do so that if we can teach them how to fish, we don't have to give them a fish anymore and they don't have to depend on us and they can build their own business on their own. So anyway, I don't want to talk more about it. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to give some time um, to watch one more video um, and then I wanted to give time for uh, questions. Um, because I've shared a little bit about my own journey, but if anyone here has questions about your own ideas or you want to know how I did something or how we did something, please feel free to ask. Um, could we have the next video play? On. Um, okay, we'll give them time to find the, the sound for the video. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. If you have any questions, you can walk to the microphone or raise your hand so that I can bring you the mic. Check. Okay, hello, uh, good morning everyone. So my name is Shania, now I'm studying Bachelor of Media and Communication. So my question is, this is about the business. So in order to do good, uh, you need to be profitable, right, for your business. So how do you find uh, the right balance between all the different goals? Very good question. Thank you. Um, so when you form, when I started Earth Air, um, it was very clear to me that this is not a traditional business. We are a social enterprise. So we're driven by our mission first. So of course we have to make money because we have to pay salaries and we have overheads to cover. But that our primary motive is not to push profit. Our primary motive is to make sure that the communities that we're working with are being helped and they are being treated fairly. And for us to create a brand and market access to be able to sell those products. So there are many times when you come to a point where you don't know whether you should pursue money or pursue humanitarian cause. So an example of this is last year, we had a refugee, one of our artisans, her husband um, was seriously injured at work. 
and she's a refugee from Afghanistan. And her husband was a cleaner in an apartment. He fell down, was seriously injured, broke his spine, um, was in ICU. And she didn't know what to do. So we went in, we talked to the doctors, we helped her through. We actually went to the employer and asked the employer to pay for all of his medical costs. And we worked through that and we had hoped he would survive, but unfortunately he passed away. So at that point in time, we had a decision to make. What was that decision? Do we waste our time by trying to help her and her family, or do we focus on making money? So it took up a lot of our team time, but we felt that the right thing to do was to help her. So we, for almost three months, we focused, because we are a small team, we actually ended up focusing a lot of our time on helping her and going to the police, going to the hospitals, um, instead of focusing on making our sales. And now she's being resettled, the husband passed away, she and her kids are being resettled to New Zealand. And she, I'm not saying this to brag, but I think if she has told us that if we didn't help her at that point, she would not have survived and her family would not, would not have come through that, that crisis. Um, so the reason why we chose to help her is exactly because of our mission. So we always go back to our mission and making sure that, I always believe this, that if you do good, you keep doing good and good will come to you. I know it may sound very naive or idealistic, but I've always believed that. that so I don't actually worry about where money is going to come from because somehow it, we always keep getting orders. And I believe that in the sense that um, with Earth Air and how we have grown as a business, of course it's not due to chance. You do make strategic decisions to help you grow your business, do marketing. You have to do that. You can't sit and expect business to come in. So you have to work on marketing and sales and building your story. So that was one of the reasons why when we built Earth Air, I wanted to make sure that it is not perceived as a charity or welfare brand because this is the mistake that I have seen a lot of different brands and social enterprises make is that you cannot sell your service or products to people based on the sob story behind the product. You, so your service or your product has to be able to compete with anyone out there. The products that you are making has to be beautiful, has to be high quality, has to function well. But you also have the bonus of a positive story behind it. But the story behind the product is always number two. It is never number one. Number one is your service and product. So it's very important that we created a brand and a brand that was trustworthy, credible, and that we could stand behind and say, we make quality products. So when you do that, then you know that as a business, you are not compromising on who you are or what you're doing. So just because we're a social enterprise, we don't expect people to buy from us to help. We want them to buy from us because we make products that are great, that are beautiful, and that last long. I hope that answers your question. So much. Uh, the answer was uh, very meaningful, and I think it helps a lot of people here. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Sassy? Would we want to watch the video first, or do you want to oh, proceed okay. with the Q&A? We have sound, yes. All right, so we watch the video first, and we'll come back for the Q&A session afterwards. Bidang mengkuang ni, saya ingat dia sangat cantik. 
daripada turun temurun dulu nenek moyang kita dulu nyaman mengkuah ni dulu secara hobi lama dah dalam 35 tahun dah rasanya the processes in mengkuah is quite tedious and labor intensive it takes about one week to just prepare the raw material it is grown wild so it got to be harvested and then you got to have them cut and then make it soft by either boil it or putting on embers. Then you got to slice the thorns away. After that, it's be sliced into required width. It can be very fine. After that, it will be soaked for two days. That is to loosen the natural color. After soaking, it will be dried until it becomes as white as possible. Only then you dye it into whatever colors you want and again dried. It's got to be woven in cool weather, if not to be brittle and hard. Kemungkinan akan berlaku sebab generasi baru dia tak berapa minat dalam bidang nyaman. Tak sedar yang kraf kita ni amat diterima oleh masyarakat luar. There is one person, only one person who can do the very fine weaving. I used to have a lot more when I started. There were so many but no there are very very few left sedangkan saya dulu saya tak tahu yang buat tantangan saya ni siapa yang nak beli tak tahu <laughs> lepas tu saya rasa banggalah dengan ber, berjoin dengan UFL ni memandangnya hasil tangan saya diterima semoga bidang kraf ni akan dipertingkatkan ke luar lagi supaya orang kenal lagi kraf kita ni produk kampung ni supaya boleh keluar lagi. There is demand but the supply is getting less and less. It's the workers, the weavers. They are a dying breed. But after they have gone, I don't know really what's going to happen. Oh, if any one person can go to the villages and tell the young ones don't go out, do this. I would love to, to see it done, you know. I think that is my dream. <laughs> Sorry, you had questions? Hi. Um, Hi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Z from Sabah Social Entrepreneurs, and I'm, my social enterprise is called Give One for Two Give. We guide and train underprivileged women to earn a sustainable income through fashions and craft, so they can climb out of poverty. I have two questions. The first question: What is the criteria for fair trade? How do artisan know? What you pay is fair because design is not a cost best but value best. How do you put a price to their like turun temurun elmu, the traditional process and the heritage? Secondly, what are you taught about using artificials or synthetic colors or natural raw materials? Sure. Thank you. Um, okay, so that's a very good question about what is fair trade. Um, fair trade is obviously a simple principle, uh, 10 principles, and one of the key principles in that is fair wages. So fair wages is how do you know that you're paying someone a fair wage? So what is the minimum wage in Malaysia right now? Does anyone know? 1,500, yes. So if you divide that into per hour, depending on whether you divide by 26 days or, or 30 days or 20 days, it can vary between um, <clears throat> 650 to 750 to about 8 ringgit an hour, right? So when you're talking about traditional heritage skills and what artisans charge, so we actually started working with communities that we work with to teach them how to price for their products. Because a lot of artisans and a lot of entrepreneurs and social enterprises didn't know how to price their product. So one of the key things that we do in our entrepreneurship training, 
with artisans is how do you price a product? And a lot of artisans forgot to price a salary for themselves. So they will price everything else in, like electricity, water, material, but they don't pay themselves a salary and they don't price their own skill and their own time into the price. So we had to teach them how to do this. And at a minimum, with the refugees that we work with, we pay them 30% or 40% more than the minimum wage. Because we feel that the minimum wage is obviously not a living wage. So what does someone need to live? So the wage that we pay them has to be higher than that. Um, you are right in the sense that sometimes communities that we work with, the prices that they want to charge us for a product is very much based on market forces. Some of them will charge based on what they feel that day. Some of them will charge on what my neighbor is selling it for. My neighbor is selling this bag for 30 ringgit, so I will also sell it for 30 ringgit. But it took them two weeks to make that bag. And if you look at a living wage, getting paid 30 ringgit for a bag that you took two weeks to make is not going to give you a livelihood. So we had to work with our artisans to help them understand that, hey, you need to actually charge us more. You need to understand that this pri the price of this product is too low and you need to charge us more. Again, this is why this is something that you would say if you are a business person, it's a stupid thing to do. To tell people that you're buying from to increase their price to you. You wouldn't do that if you were just concerned about making a profit. But when you're a social enterprise and you want to make sure that the people that you're working with are taken care of, you have to think differently and you have to make sure that they are taken care of first and your product pricing and your business has to work around them and the prices that you set have to be able to pay the artisans what they need. Your second question about artificial dyes. Um, so that is a problem um, in the sense that with a lot of natural fibers, like for example, like the mengkuang that we worked with, it is um, an artificial dye, but it's azure-free. What that means is that dye does not harm the environment. So um, azure-free dyes are like the minimum requirement for dyeing natural leaves so that it doesn't damage the environment, yeah. So I'm not gonna get into the technicalities of, of that, but there are so many things to think about when you are a mission-based business. You have to think about the people that you work with, the material that you use, what happens to your products at the end of a useful life. You know, you have to think as a circular, um, circular economy concepts so that you are not damaging the environment in the process of you making money and in the process of you growing your business. So it's actually, a, it, it may feel like it's a very high bar, but if we don't start thinking about these questions, we will never get there. So often when I speak to companies and CEOs, I always say sustainability has to be in your DNA. It cannot be something that we think about at the end after we have already done whatever we are doing. It has to be incorporated into our business model itself. So how we make money has to incorporate values of thinking about who are we buying from? What are we doing with our waste? How are we building our business? Are we impacting the environment negatively? Are we making sure that our employees are safe and well taken care of? So all of these things need to be thought of holistically. I hope that answers. <laughs> okay. Um, does anyone have any other questions? I'll be around after, so you can always ask me more questions. Anyone else? Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Shabir Kafari. Oh. 
uh, student of uh, business administration. It's my first year, and I am the ambassador of G17 and coordinator of Al Bukhari International University in G17. Uh, my question belongs to the theme of today's topic. So the theme is that, so you want to save the world. Um, as you have mentioned, some of the topic that belongs to the SDG 1, SDG 8, and SDG 12. So how can we like uh, implement these goals to save the world, not even a country? Uh, so what is the idea about this team that we are selecting this? As I am working for this uh, G17, and my team is already here, all of them. So how can we uh, implement this to the world, not just a country? And the second question, it belongs to like the same SDGs that, um, uh, will this 17 SDGs that United Nations has said that uh, we will achieve sustainable world by 2013, will this surely work for this world or not? Just a point of view from you. Thank you. Sorry, can you repeat the last question? Uh, the last question belongs to the SDGs. The yep. United Nations has se set 17 uh, goals. Uh, for sustainability of this world. So lots of the topic, we saw that uh, the topic was about SDGs, sustainable development. So as an ambassador, I'm asking you that what's your point of view? Will these goals surely help us to see this world sustainable by 2013 or not? So that was the second question. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Okay, so how do you implement it globally? Um, that is, I think, you need obviously policies. So sometimes I think we can have analysis paralysis in the sense that we may not always think that the choices that we make, albeit how small they are, can actually make a difference in the rest of the world. So we need to make sure that we are making an effort to do what we can in our sphere of influence, that it's in our control, to achieve what we can. So I, I'm not going to be focusing on whether the whole world is doing good or not, but what can I do in my community, in my sphere of influence that I can change? So that's what I believe, that's how change can happen. So if you think about change as a nucleus, you need people who will build that nucleus. So if you don't have a nucleus to build on, then all of the cells cannot replicate and grow bigger and bigger. So people need to come together to create a nucleus for change. So you and your friends, if you guys are coming together as a nucleus, and then your nucleus will grow into split into different cells. And that's how I think social enterprise works. And that's what I hope all of us will look at what we're doing. In terms of whether I think SDG goals will be reached by 2030 or not, um, we're already at 2022. I don't think we will. I don't think we're there yet. Um, and I think there's a lot more that needs to be done, obviously at a global level, country level, and micro level, I mean, so, not just Malaysia, many countries are far away, I, I believe, from achieving that. But I think if you, obviously, if you don't have goals, then you never get anywhere. So, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much. My name is um, Kamal Dean Abdullah Ibn Chambas. Oh. I'm pursuing human resource management and I am the current president-elect for African Student Association in Albuquerque International University. Before I proceed, ladies and gentlemen, let us show our um, dear woman some love. Please let us show her some love. <laughs> in fact, um, um, we are really proud of you uh, to see a woman like you um, trying to impact the world. Thank you so much for this. In fact, we cannot buy it with money. You are, giving out, uh, you, have, you are giving out this education for free. Fast forward, my question is, um, has to do with, um, this, there are a lot of students in Albuquerque International University that are having a lot of business ideas. They are having a lot of uh, things that they are doing. 
However, the support. So my question is that since you are interested in changing the world, how do you intend helping our students on campus so that their dream will come true? As I indicated earlier on, my name is Kamal Dean Abdullah Ibn Chambas. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Kamal. Okay, so I get asked this question a lot as well, as in, if I'm graduating, what do I do next? Do I start a social enterprise straight away, right? So there are a lot of university students, well, a famous one that has done that is uh, Picha Project, right? So they were a group of university students that came together and started a, a successful social enterprise. But my advice to social, uh, university students like yourself is don't do that. I think there is immense value in working for other people, learning work ethics, learning how to be disciplined, learning what it means to work and how hard you have to work and what that means, you know, like the meaning of hard work. So for me in my journey, I didn't start Earth Air when I was out of university. I didn't start it in my 20s. I started, started it in my early 30s. So the initial capital that I needed for Earth Air came from my personal savings. So I used my personal savings to, as capital. And for the first three years, when we didn't have um, enough money to pay a salary to anyone, I couldn't hire anyone, I couldn't pay myself a salary, how did I survive? I did a lot of consulting work and I used my savings. So that was one of the ways that I feel I could get around the whole idea of not having support. Because I, had, I worked, I built my own support. I built my capital so that I could invest in my own idea. And that's not always possible, but I think that that helped me have a lot of flexibility in how I grew the business and what I wanted to do. Because early on, we had a lot of investors, um, social impact investors that came and said, hey, can we invest? But I said, no, I didn't want external investment because I wanted to be able to prove to myself that the business model works before we took in any investors. So, and these are all choices that is very personal. Not everyone thinks it's the right thing to do. I mean. If you see, there's a lot of tech startups that have millions being poured into them. And those startups have not actually proven their business model works. But they have an idea, and it's a great idea that, that investors think will work, and they invest in it. But for me, I wanted to prove to people that social enterprise business model works. Because that was one of the doubts that people had. How can you make money if you are trying to help people and you're trying to make money at the same time, you're never gonna work, you're never gonna get enough money. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that the business itself is sustainable, it will break even and we will make a profit before we actually started thinking about external investors. Um, so how am I going to help students at Alpukari? <laughs> um, I will speak to the Alphakari team, um, and maybe I can offer to mentor one student a year. Is that, is that good? <laughs> um, so I, I don't normally mentor people. I try to encourage people to reach out and find and learn on their own. Um, but I've come to a point in my life, it's now going to be almost 10 years of Earth Air. And um, I think I have a wonderful team um, that is doing a great job, so I can spend a little bit more time um, on mentoring, and I'd be happy to do that. So one person a year that I will work with to help them with their business idea. I think Kamaldin is very happy with the answer now, and he's waiting to register for the mentoring program. Yes, Kamal. So should we take one or two more questions, I think? Yeah, sure, go ahead. All right, uh, morning, I'm Rizwan. I'm a first year student uh, in Bachelor of Media and Communication. My question is, knowing what you know, 
what you have done differently 10 years ago? Thank you. Very good question, thank you. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I have learned is humility. Um, I think, okay, when I first started Earth Air, um, I was trying to do everything by myself, right? In the sense that I was like, hey, you know, I'm educated. I went to a business school. I can do this. You know, I know what to do. I have all the theory. I'm smart enough. I can figure it out. But when you are running a business, you, it's not a one-man show. You cannot be an island, and you must have the humility to ask for help. And the people around you, they don't know that you need help if you don't ask. So that was the very first lesson that I learned in my journey, is that I need to have humility to ask. And being a social entrepreneur, or being an entrepreneur, is probably one of the most humbling experiences in life. Because you are starting from scratch, you have nothing, you are a nobody, nobody knows you, no one cares about you, and you have absolutely nothing. So that experience in itself is a teaching moment because you have to then slowly build yourself up. And a lot of times when I you know, do speaking events like this, you know, people look at, oh, you know, your products, da, 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 da. but you have to think that this today didn't happen today. It happened over 10 years. And it's happened over many moments of ups and downs. Um, and so entrepreneurship is not for everybody. So I know that everybody wants to be their own boss and wants to start their own business. And I hear that all the time. I want to start this, I want to start this. And I think, okay, that's great. But maybe one of the best things you can do is go and work for someone else. If you want to learn about social enterprise, go and work for another social entrepreneur. Volunteer your time and learn what they're doing or even work as an intern or join their team. Find out what is it that they do, work with them, learn, and then you can figure out whether this is really what you want to do. Because entrepreneurship is not for everybody. And it is not a route that I myself would have chosen maybe because it's been one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life to give up a comfortable position or comfortable life and um, start something that I had no idea was going to work. And I struggled with my self-esteem a lot in the beginning, like when I told you about my ex-boss walking and I ran to the toilet so that he wouldn't see me like selling a bunch of scarves. Um, so, I think um, it's something to think about, and I think that there's a lot of value in working for other people and learning work ethics and work discipline. Um, and also, when you work for someone else, if you make a mistake, you're making a mistake on someone else's dime. So, you know, you can make a mistake on their money, so you learn from those mistakes, and when you start your own business, you don't make those mistakes. Can we take one more question? Okay, we have one here. Oh, Hi, Sassy. It's a privilege uh, to have you with us today. Hello. Uh, I'm Marina. I'm from the Language Center in AIU. So my question is, how do you actually manage circumstances, I mean detours in your life, when things do not actually go as in your plan, you know, as what you have planned before, so things mm -hmm. do not go that way. So how do you manage with that? Thank you. Um, so I guess one of the biggest things in that could be COVID pandemic, um, because in March, on March 18th, um, when that everything was shut down, uh, you know, as a small social enterprise, we hardly had any savings in the bank to survive that period, right? So again, we were led by the desire to do good and not money. So at that point, we were thinking, Oh no, because doctors were contacting us and asking us if we can sew PPE for them. So at that point, you know, we weren't thinking about how we're going to make money from this or, you know, but we were like, oh wait, people are dying. 
we need to do something. So we went and sourced for PPE material. We got the patents from P uh, for making PPE from another social enterprise in Sarawak, Tanoti, Jackie Fong. Um, Jackie gave us her plans and we made the PPE. But because we made that PPE, we survived the whole of the COVID pandemic. Because we were able to, um, what we did was we raised money and we told people exactly what that money went to. So each of our PPE sets was priced at 20 ringgit, I think. And we broke down the pricing. So we told people what, you know, how much money for materials, how much money for labor, how much money was coming to us to run the whole thing. And that helped us and our artisans survive through almost a year and a half of no income. Because we couldn't run our business normally but we were able to earn money from, um, to support, like, at least pay for our costs over that period, um, and we survived that. So, again, when I, when I look back at that, you know, like, I think if we were a normal business just looking at making money, we would have probably shut down then because we had no money to pay overheads. We wouldn't have survived for 18 months with very little income. But because we chose to do something that we felt was helping, that ended up being our route to survival. Yeah, so, so that's what I always tell the team as well, is that the focus is what can we do that is good and that is right and that we know is, is honorable and true. So if, as long as we follow that, then everything else will fall into place. Because when I first started Earth Air, you know, I was struggling with, oh, nobody knows about Earth Air. How do we get people to know about us? And then I have a, we had a Japanese client who gave this very good advice. And he said, don't go and beg other people to come to you. You just keep doing a good job and keep doing what you do. And people will come alongside you. And that's exactly what has happened. Can we take one last question? Okay, sure. All right, one last question. Excuse me, can I ask one question? Here, up, up here. Oh. Sorry, there's someone else down here. Okay, we'll take both then. That's, and then afterwards, talk to me after this is done. Um, I mean, as in the other questions. Um, just talk to me after we end the talk because I don't want to keep everybody for too much. Okay. So, yes, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, so, my question is uh, by the way, I am Nurul Aina Binti Johari. I'm the lecturer from SBSS. Uh, my question is how can the small social entrepreneurs benefit from economic of skills to get the market advantage? Because we know that most of the social entrepreneurs, they produce in small amounts. So it's hard for them to absorb the cost to maintain, to sustain uh, their existence. So how can the small entrepreneurs uh, keep on sustaining their businesses? Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And can I have your question? Uh, morning, everyone. So I have two questions, actually. So the first one is, uh, for AIU, we're already taking steps to saving the world through three zero clubs and encouraging our students to participate in uh, the Hard Price Challenge. So what is the role that universities have, as well as other academic institutions, who do not have an environmental niche in saving the environment? And then for my second question, how can we make, for example, weaving to become more sustainable so that the skills still exist in, for example, the next 30 years? Okay, Thank I'm you. gonna answer the first question and then you have to remind me of these two questions again. <laughs> um, okay, so your question about scaling and how to work as a small social entrepreneur, right? Um, so I'm actually gonna use um, the Saba Social Entrepreneurs Group as a fantastic example of how you can scale. So, 
The reason why is that when I first started Earth Air, there were so few of us. There was only about five or six social enterprises. And at that time, when I wanted to try and ask all of us to collaborate, everybody was too busy trying to build our own businesses. You know? So it's like you're trying to survive, so you don't have time to collaborate. But in fact, that is the best time to collaborate. So because you're so small, you actually have the opportunity to grow by collaborating. Because if you don't collaborate, it could be the end of you. So I think that for small social enterprises to scale, if you're trying to do it on your own, it is extremely hard. And the reason that for Earth Air, we were able to survive this long is because we were one of the first movers. We were one of the earliest social enterprises in Malaysia, so it helped because we got early like first mover advantage, I suppose. But for a lot of social enterprises now that are starting, it's a lot harder to grow because there are so many more competitors. So how do you survive in that is to form an affinity group and to work together with other social enterprises to be able to scale what you're doing. Because if you are a group and you can approach clients and customers, and the Sabah Social Entrepreneurs Group has done this. They have come together and brought everybody in Sabah together and said, hey, we can group together, form an alliance, and we can now go and reach customers representing the whole of Sabah. And that is fantastic. And that is one of the key ways that you can grow is by partnership and collaboration. Um, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, sorry, can you remind me of your two questions again? So uh, the first one is, uh, for AIU, we are already taking steps to saving the world through the three zero clubs and encouraging students to participate in the Hard Price Challenge. What is the role of universities and academic institutions who do not have an environmental niche in saving the environment? That's the first question. Okay. And then for the second question, how can we make weaving, for example, more sustainable so that the skills still exist in the next 30 years? Okay, um, I'm, gonna ask this, I'm gonna answer the second question first. So something like weaving is in fact already an extremely sustainable practice because it is low carbon, there's no electricity being used, it's hand done, um, and it's actually very environmental. Um, and one of the key things, like what Khadija was saying in the video, is how do we help this to continue? Is actually making the skill um, something that people can earn a livelihood from. So that is one of the key issues that we are grappling with at the moment, because a lot of the artisans that we work with are in their 70s, or they are passing away already. So we are now working with the next generation. Um, so if, for example, like Katnelli, um, we actually worked with her daughter. Um, and we, are, we have some plans in place to potentially hire her to be our representative in, in Sarawak, um, is to be able to help the next generation earn an income. Because we saw a lot of young people in the villages who would rather go and work at 7-Eleven or at a factory um, that would pay them minimum wage rather than do weaving. Um, so one of the reasons why we want, that's why at Earth Air we really wanted to raise the value of, the, of handmade products because it shouldn't be seen as something made in the kampong and that you just pay like 30 ringgit for. Because I had this question asked by a client in, in Earth Air long ago, she said, this bag is made out of mengkuang, and it's made in a village. So why is it 180 ringgit? Why should I pay 180 ringgit for it? So that's why we made that video. <laughs> because we wanted to explain to people the process of even processing the material and how long it takes and how long it takes to weave so that people understand the skills that go behind it. The same way that we paid Prada or Giorgio Armani or whoever, thousands and thousands of ringgit for the products that they make. We want them 
we want people to understand that the same craftsmanship, or even better, is going into these products. And these products should be elevated as products that are artists and not products that are like welfare. So that's one of the ways that we are hoping and trying to change and elevate traditional craftsmanship and also help the next generation earn enough income so that they will continue those skills. Um, and your first question about how to help when you don't have an environmental element, um, there are a lot of NGOs and a lot of social enterprises that are working with environmental causes. For example, like my husband's social enterprise, Sea Monkey Project, you can contact him and your students can go and help him and work with him on ocean pollution and plastic waste. He would very gladly work with your students. Um, yes, Carlos? <laughs> um, so that's one of the ways that I think can be done is actually incorporating collaborations and partnerships with organizations that are already doing what the students may be interested in because you don't have to build everything in-house. You don't have to spend money and build everything in the university. There are other people doing amazing things around you and around the world that you can build collaborations and partnerships with to enrich the experience of your students. Thank you so much, Asasi. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think much. we have to end it here, but I will be here afterwards, so please feel free to ask me a question. My husband is raising his hand. I'll talk to you later, Carlos. <laughs> okay, thank you so much again from us. So I think thank we you. can change the title or the topic today so you can save the world, right? We have gained a lot from this talk today. Thanks one more time to Sassy for the insightful and impactful sharing. We're very happy to have you here with us. And we have prepared some tokens of appreciation for our speaker, Ms. Sassy by Kimis. We would like you to accept this gift in appreciation of your time spent with us today. I would like to invite Dr. Muhammad Zainal bin Sha'ari to present the token to our speaker. I would like to bring your attention to the gift. It is an exquisite handmade home decor pieces from the Corium collection, decorated with Swarovski crystals. You will find more of this at the Islamic Arts Museum Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. Thank you, Dato. AIU also has prepared something for our speaker today. May I please have our Honourable DVC Research and Innovation to present a humble gift made by our students of Aromatherapy Lab. The aromatherapy candles made from used cooking oil as part of their social business project. Aha, uh -huh. I have a request here from the other half, from her other half. The husband would like to be in front with Sasi. Please come forward, sir.
once again, thank you very much, Sasi, for your time, for your insights. Uh -huh, there is a special message today. We did not plan for this, but here the floor is yours, sir. Uh, there was one girl, I can't remember where you exactly were, you were somewhere over there, and you asked the very first question about the balance between um, profit and keeping it for yourself. Keep in mind there are many different ways to get job satisfaction and money is not the main one. You will make a decision when you get into business how much money you want to get away based on how much money you want to give away based on the amount of enjoyment you're going to get from the return of that money. We give away, Sussy's company and our company give away enormous amounts of money to people in need and we do that a lot of the time to the detriment of ourselves but we do it because we get a lot of satisfaction from that and that satisfaction is worth more to us than the money. So don't think of the money as being the only measure then the only driver. Think about the satisfaction that you'll get from what that money actually is doing. The, the refugee communities that we work with I never would have thought that I would ever get any enjoyment from them, but they invite us into their houses and we go and sit there and have dinner with them and we've, their son got born here with no home country and he is now two years old and he, we are known as his uncles and aunties and that money can't buy that. So always think about what are you gonna get in return other than money? That was all that I wanted to say, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. That does not only answer Shania's question, it answers everybody's question today in the hall, yes? All right. Guest, I think you received your goodie bags. When you registered earlier, when you scan your QR code, you received this bag. Can you please show us your bag if you have one? Your goodie bags. Okay, those beautiful bags are made of old newspaper by Puan Norliza Ramli from Padi Beras National. Today, we have distributed 350 bags and Puan Norliza used 525 pages of unused broad newspaper and 560 meters of natural jute strings. She spent 15 minutes per bag. Do the math, people. 15 minutes per bag. We have 350 bags today. It means she spent 87.5 minutes to make the bags just for you. And here's a short video for you. Don't forget, we have many booths set outside, okay? Located at the foyer. We have one booth from the Earth Air itself, Earth Air. Go and visit, please don't forget. And we also have a booth from Sabah Social Entrepreneurs Association, booth from AIU students. We have AIU Alive Shop, we have Plastigo, we have booth uh, from Post Teach and Therapy Lab. Go grab the candles, please, they're all good. Earth Air, of course, our speaker's um, booth, special for you today. Coffee to go, and we also have Tactic Visual Solutions and Manara Alostar. So after this talk, please pay your visit to the booth and grab as many merchandise, as many items as you can to show your support. Can we do that? Yes.
I answer for you, yes. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, let us capture this moment. We would like to have a group photo, therefore I would like to invite all the invitees, the guests, to come forward for the group photo. Don't worry, our cameramen and photographers will lead you where to stand. All right, audience, could you please stand up and we squeeze to the centre. VIPs can remain seated. Audience, could we please squeeze to the middle? so that everybody can fit in the photo. You may come closer, people at the back, okay? Everyone, please come closer to the centre. And then uh, I need help to close the door to have a better image. Okay, I think it's okay. Yeah. Okay, decide. Or else decide. You can move to move to front. Move to front then. Those who are behind, come closer to this side. Closer to this side. We still have empty space on this side. Come. Those on the second floor, go on the center. Come, come, closer. Okay, are we ready, right? Okay, in one, two, three, give me E, E, okay. Okay, okay, one thumbs up. It's not cover other faces, just in front of you, okay? Thumbs up, one, two, three. Okay, the last one is candid one, okay? 
Oke, okay, one, two, three. Oke, okay, the final one is three zero. Oke, okay, we need a three zero. Please everyone, I want to see your three. Oke, okay. ready cameraman? One, two, three. Oke, okay, thank you. Oke, okay, on the second floor, please, three. <laughs> Oke, okay. on the second floor. Oke, okay, thank you guys. Oke, okay, thank you everyone. Those who attend this uh, event, outside they, we are preparing one postcard for the what uh, Miss Madam Sasi are briefing. You may collect that postcard outside.